All right, so let's talk about how to keep your bait alive. Well, for starters, let's talk about what kills your bait. So the three things that'll kill your bait are ammonia, oxygen, and temperature. In this video, I'm gonna tell you how I tackle all three of those. There's different ways to do it, but I'm gonna show you how I do it. So number one, oxygen, most important one. Oxygen alone, a little aerator that costs $12, $15, is gonna take your baits with no aeration, 15, 20 minutes, they're dead. It's gonna take it to three or four hours, possibly, before they die, perhaps even longer. What's the most important part of an aerator? It's the air stone. So when you buy an aerator, like 90% of them come with a little tiny, whoa, oh, I'm fishing, just so you guys know. They come with a little tiny air stone, okay? And these things are, they're, they're crap. I'm not gonna tell you to throw that thing away. And the reason why is if you get in a bind and you really need an air stone because you messed yours up, you lost yours, something happened, your air stone's not working properly. Don't throw it away, hang on to it. But what I want you to do is go to your pet store, wherever that is, go to Walmart, uh, go to any of these places and buy a big air stone, something like, you know, they sell them in like six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, 14 inch. Uh, they've got the long ones. They've got the, the circle pads. I think those are probably even, those are the best, but I can't find one around here. But those are probably the best, the circle ones. But you need a big air stone, okay? Most of the time, people think their aerators are going bad. What actually is happening is their stones are going bad and it's forcing their aerator to work three times, four times as hard. And the battery life of those things is supposed to be something like 32 hours. And you really, like I was, when I very first started using aerators, I was going through like, I was going through two D batteries in like an eight, 12 hour span. And I was like, well, my aer aerator's messed up. Something wrong with my aerator. That wasn't the case. I was actually, I actually had a problem with my air stones. After like five or six years of buying a new aerator every single year. So I think one year about two realized it was my air stones that were going bad. Uh, I actually now have five working aerators that all work perfectly fine. There was nothing wrong with the aerators is the air stone. Uh, how does your air stone go bad? So one of the things you shouldn't do, don't let your air stone dry out. Keep it wet all the time. Uh, my air stones stay wet 24 seven 365 days a year until they go bad. How do they go bad? When they dry out, all the little sediment and particles that are in the water uh, will actually go up into your air stone, harden. And that rock is really porous and that's what releases the air bubbles, right? And it's really easy for the, that aerator to push those bubbles out, push that air out that air stone and disperses the bubbles, which is what you want. That aerates better and more efficiently when those holes start collapsing because there's stuff getting hard inside them, it forces your aerator to work two, three, four times as hard. And it just doesn't work out. Like it, like you'll think there's something wrong. Like you'll be going through batteries like crazy. But really, it's just your air stones. So you've got to take care of your air stones. Uh, buy three or four of them. Uh, if you get home late from a trip or something and you dumped all your water out and you forget about it because it's four in the morning like I've done a hundred times and it dries out, I usually just pitch it throw it away even though it's probably still good it's fine i still just pitch it throw it away get a new one so yeah take care of your air stones let's move on to the second part we'll talk about temperature so temperature will kill your baits like you can have the best oxygen aeration you could possibly imagine you could go buy there are some aerators out there that are really expensive there's also some filtration systems that are really expensive that you can use. You could have the best top of the line stuff. If you don't have a way to cool your water down, you will kill your baits. And let's face it, we do a lot of flathead fishing with live baits in the summertime. It's hot. Here in Indiana, it routinely reaches triple digits. Water gets hot. You got to keep your bait cool. If you don't, you're going to kill it. One of the ways that I do this, I use ice cubes. I use ice cubes. I take a tray that comes and it usually makes like, I don't know, like 20 ice cubes. Freeze it catch my bait, bring it home, throw all 20 ice cubes in there, and poof, I'm good. Now, now if you make those ice cubes out of tap water, that's gonna move on 
to the third thing that you got to watch out for, and that is ammonia, right? Now, the ammonia has nothing to do with the, the tap water, uh, but what it is the, is there's chlorine in your tap water. So you're going to want to get an additive to take the chlorine out if you use ice cubes like I do. I bought a product that takes the chlorine out of the water and also takes the ammonia out of the water. So I bought one product that takes care of a couple of different problems that I have, and it's called Bait Saver. I'll put a picture of it up here uh, so you guys can see it, but this stuff is amazing. It turns your water kind of a dark blue. Uh, you don't, you, like one bottle of it is like, I think it was like 30 bucks, and it's lasted me, I think I'm about halfway through it, and I'm about halfway through the year. Holy crap. That's a big bait I have on here, guys. It's freaking me out right now. Uh, but anyway, another way you can tackle the temperature part, some people will freeze a bottle of water. That's another excellent way. Uh, I don't really like using that method just because I don't like a, a free-floating bottle of water in my bait tank. I just don't like that. Uh, but you can use that 100%, and it'll if you don't want to get any additive to take the chlorine out and you don't want to have to mess with that, that's an excellent way to do that to keep that water cool. One thing you don't want to do is put too much ice or cool your water down way too much. I like to keep my bait tank water right around 70 degrees. I think that's a good temperature. Uh, for me it works really well and it's going to keep your baits a lot more lively. When I keep my water cool and I reach down into my bait bucket and it's like an explosion happens in there, that's when I know I've done my job. Nice. Right, I've done a good job of keeping my baits cool, plenty of oxygen, keeping the ammonia levels down, and that's going to make your baits really come alive. And that's what you want. It's all about vibration. When we fish with live bait, it's how alive can you keep your bait, right? Because that vibration is what brings those fish in. That's what's giving those fish the hint that, that a bait is nearby, is they can feel that. If you're fishing for things that are more sight predators, things like largemouth bass, which do hone in on vibration, but a lot of times bass are also looking like they're, they're it's a visual cue for them. Uh, live baits, the livelier your bait, the better. So once you've got all that stuff, what are you going to put your bait in, right? Well, they don't call it a bait bucket for nothing. You can use a bucket. I've got two of them, which is what I'm currently using. Uh, I've got two of them made out of coolers. I've made one out of a flower pot before. I've made one out of a trash can before. Really any water holding apparatus will be just fine. It's the needs of, of the fishermen, right? Like what do you need it for? I personally like things that I can carry really easily. A bucket with a really nice handle on it is easy to carry. So I use a bucket. So now that we've talked a little bit about how to keep your baits alive for a lot longer. I can keep my baits alive like that for at least 24 hours. 24 hours solid. Like I can keep my baits alive. So let's talk about the second half of this video, which is going to be about hooking baits. So there's three main ways that I like to hook baits. One of them is right through the back, right behind the dorsal fin. And I'll have a demonstration of that here in just a second. I like to hook my baits right behind the anal fin on the bottom half of the fish in the fleshy meaty part just behind the gut pocket I like to hook my baits right through the mouth as well when I'm dealing with sunfish type panfish and things like that that I'm using for bait I'm almost never gonna hook them in the mouth almost never I don't care what the current situation is the way I look at it is if I need to hook a, a sunfish in the mouth because the current is so strong then I'm gonna find a new place to fish uh, sometimes hooking a bait in the mouth is good if you're going to be casting it and reeling it in, casting it and reeling it in. Oh my gosh. Dude. Something scare you, bud? Mm, that's literally like a pound and a half or a pound and a quarter bluegill. It's a massive bluegill. It's huge. In the video you guys are about to see, that's not the, the bluegill that I used in the demonstration. This is another one. Uh, I accidentally killed my other one because I think I got a little bit below the thermocline and it ended up killing that bluegill. So I had to catch another one and it's a, it's a freaking giant. Uh, but anyway, 
Uh, let me go ahead and show you that footage of, of how I like to hook my sunfish type bait. All right, so in this bucket, I have two bluegills and I'm gonna show you guys how I hook them. There's a couple of different ways I like to hook them. So the first way I like to hook these guys, when I'm fishing, especially when I'm fishing in a no current situation, this is an ADOT circle hook, is right here, back behind this anal fin. I come in right here, boom. I like to do this, especially with my smaller baits. That way the weight of the hook is keeping the fish upright, just like that. Okay, so here we have a little bit bigger bluegill. I got a nine knot J hook right here. This dorsal fin right here on the back, I like to go just behind it and right below. Notice this line, this very, very distinct line that runs right here. This is a lateral line, guys. This line right here represents right about where their spinal column is in the fish. I always try to stay in between that and their back. Okay, you don't want to get into their spinal column. Make sure you remove the scales. And that's it. Look at this bait. This bait's really going nuts. I really like that behind the, the anal fin set. It's, I really like it, especially for smaller baits. One thing you wanna watch when you're hooking your baits like this, guys, is reeling them in too much. Okay, you don't wanna reel them in super fast and you don't wanna reel them in often, right? This is sort of a, just to cast this bait out there and leave it. And the reason why is you drag that bait backwards, uh, you can actually kill it. Now, if, you're, if you hook a bait through the lips, you really don't have to worry too much about that. You can reel them in more often. Uh, it's really good to just leave your bait sitting. That's gonna help keep them alive. So now that I've showed you guys how I like to hook my sunfish type baits, now I'll tell you a little bit about how I like to hook minnows, suckers, shiners, creek chubs, anything like that. Uh, I almost exclusively hook them through the lips. Uh, the reason why is just trial and error. That seems to be the way those fish like to be hooked. They're the most active that way. Uh, you don't kill them as much. Uh, I think most of you know how to hook a bait uh, through the lips. You just go right through the lips. I try to stay between the lips and that little clear membrane that's in the front of them. I don't have any on me right now, so I can't really do a live demonstration, but uh, it's not that hard. Uh, I think you could pretty much figure out how to, how to hook those things. Uh, but yeah, I almost never do that. Some pointers that I want to I talk about when it comes to your live baits and the gear that you're gonna use for it. So like the rule of thumb, as far as I'm concerned, is, let's okay, let's say you're gonna go after big fish, so you, the first thing you do is you go out and you buy big hooks, right? Wrong. The hooks that you use should match the bait you have available to you, right? So like right now I have a one pound, a one and a quarter pound uh, bluegill on. The hook I have is a nine knot J hook probably the small side for that bait. I should probably be more in the 10, maybe even as high as like a 12 aught for that bait. Uh, but a 9J is the biggest one that I have. So let me repeat that so you guys, you guys understand what I mean. The size of your hook should be determined by the size of the bait you have available to you. If you have a bunch of three and four inch bluegills, I wouldn't necessarily recommend putting on 10 aught hooks. I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm not saying that it won't work, but in my experience, if your hook is too big, it's going to kill your bait. And it doesn't give your bait that action that you want. You want that bait out there swimming around. You want him getting after it, you know, trying to move and stuff. When, it, when you got a giant piece of steel stuck through his back that's way too big for him, obviously, you're just going to roll him over and it's going to kill that fish. And he's not going to be as active as he could be. When it comes to thing, uh, when it comes to other kinds of baits, like to, let's take a green sunfish for example, I've experimented with green sunfish tremendously. I've hooked them in the bottom, below the or right above the anal fin, and I've hooked them in the back, and I've hooked them through the lips. In my opinion, green sunfish. I don't know why. I don't know if it's what it is, but in my experience, when you hook a green sunfish right behind the dorsal fin, they go nuts. That seems to be like. That's where you want to hook those little fish. I don't know why, uh, but in my opinion, it's, it's right behind the dorsal fin. If you're suspending baits, for example, uh, you can actually move that hook up a little closer to right in the middle of the dorsal fin. I've actually seen people 
uh, hook baits right in the front of the dorsal fin, almost on their heads. Uh, you, that's okay too, especially if you're suspending baits or you're floating baits somehow, uh, putting them on a jug line, whatever. Whenever my family and I were doing bank lines, uh, a lot of times we would hook them right through the back. When it comes to things like bullheads, uh, I've only used bullheads for flat catfish bait, I think like once in my life, or may have been another time. Um, I didn't catch anything on it that night. Uh, but I just hooked them right through, right, right back behind the dorsal fin. And that seemed to work just fine. They were really good baits. They never stopped moving. I've seen people hook them through the lips. Uh, I don't really, you know, I, I think if you always have the option, I would hook something through the back, unless it's something in the sucker or minnow family. I always like to, to hook those right through the lips. I hope you guys got something out of this. I hope you uh, are able to take care of your baits a little bit better. Hopefully contributes to you catching more fish because you have livelier baits because uh, that's what it's all about uh, flathead catfish flatheads during certain times of the year um, I would say exhibit characteristics a little bit more towards using scent and things like that for uh, to find food especially in the very early part of the year or the very very late part of the year but basically throughout the rest of the time Especially, in my opinion, like that whole month of pre-spawn. So here in Indiana, that's about uh, that's about May to the end of June. Like the, the middle, late part of May to the end of June, it's all about vibration. Uh, vibration is huge. Uh, also in the middle of late summer, you know, after July, you get into August, early September, times like right now. Uh, I think vibration is entirely the way to go. A little bit of an update. I actually bought a microphone that I was going to use to record this episode. I tested it out a few times and it sounds amazing. However, I'm trying to figure out a way to, for like a practical application because it comes with a nine foot cord and it's a little annoying. And I also have to unplug it every time I change batteries, which you guys have no idea. I change batteries. Oh my gosh, I change batteries so much uh, whenever I'm filming. It's unbelievable. So, I mean, it's I got to try and figure something out. I don't know if I can get some kind of Bluetooth device for it or what. I don't know. But I really hope this video helps you guys out a lot. So, again, guys, I hope you have a wonderful day. And I hope you got something out of the video. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you want to see more content like this, you want to see more informational stuff, Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it. We're closing in on a thousand guys. I'm super excited. I really love hearing from all of you. I really like that I get these messages all the time. It tells me that I helped them. Uh, and I can't honestly think of a better feeling when it comes to doing what I'm doing than when somebody tells me that, that I actually helped them out and uh, they were able to uh, make some really cool memories. So that being said, see you in the next one.